And I would please uh, again welcome Stefan Jensen from Scantech to give us an update on the latest uh, of his projects with direct expansion ammonia, your low charge. You have a bunch of these in the market, so we look forward to hearing what's the latest and the best. And uh, please feel free to share screen and uh, you can start anytime you're ready. Excellent. We see the screen and it's all yours. Thank you, Stefan. Okay. Can you hear me too? Yes. I'll see if I can move the slides forward. Sometimes they're a little slow. I'll try with a mouse. Looking all okay. good. Looking all good. All right. Great. Are we good? Absolutely. Yes, you can go ahead. Thank you. I think this is the wrong. Oh, 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 I've got the wrong presentation up. Is this the uh, this is the milestone one, isn't it? This is the one for the Australia, right? The Southeast Asia would be presented in the afternoon, in the session after lunch. Okay. I think that's okay, the so, so I'm going to talk about a a couple of systems. Uh, one, uh, as you can see, there's a low charge ammonia plant with a cold lake air distribution. It's a system we. Um, completed a couple of years ago in in Melbourne. So it is, uh, the evaporators are um, uh, what we call insulated coolers. Uh, so this means the uh, evaporator and the fans are inside an insulated box. And these evaporators are installed above the um, ante room. So there's no ducting uh, inside the refrigerated space. There are no evaporators inside the refrigerated space. And there's uh, air side segregation between the refrigerated space and the actual evaporator. So in the event that there's an ammonia leak um, coming out of the evaporator, uh, we can isolate the evaporator on the air side from the refrigerated space so that the goods that are stored inside the freezer are not affected by the ammonia that is escaping from the cooling coil. <clears throat> uh, the insulated air coolers, we've done two plants like this with uh, automatic ambient air defrost. And the way this works is that when we want to defrost, um, the evaporator is isolated on the air side from the freezer. And then we take air from the ceiling cavity above the ante room and circulate that through the cooling coil and um, that way there are no liquid hammer it's a common problem with hot gas defrost that we get a uh, liquid hammer either when we close the liquid line or when we turn the evaporator back on again uh, those safety issues are completely eliminated with this concept all the maintenance uh, happens outside the refrigerated space in other words it is not required for any maintenance personnel to enter uh, the refrigerator space or the freezer for any reason. All the maintenance happens on top of the, of the ante room where the evaporator is located. And in this particular job, there's less than 25 kilograms of ammonia in all of the evaporators combined. But this is quite a sizable facility, uh, 60,000 cubic meters. I'll speak a bit more about that later. The total inventory is less than 500 kg. In, in Australia, the 500 kg threshold is important. Anything above that and the facility will be classified as a dangerous good storage facility. So it's advantageous for the developer and, and also for approval issues to stay be below the, the 500 kilogram threshold. It's different in other countries, but this is what it is here. And then we have a um, a desiccant drying system, not so much for extending the defrost intervals within the freezer, but more to prevent the occurrence of slippery floors. Slippery floors are a safety issue. 
and called forklifts and uh, to, to slide around and it called people to fall over and break bones. And then the final point is uh, stainless steel refrigerant piping is used throughout. Here in Australia, we have a standard called AS3788. And under that standard, you are required to inspect uh, for mechanical integrity below the insulation at certain intervals. Uh, this is kind of uh, eliminated by, with the use of stainless steel materials. So this particular customer, he came from uh, three facilities totaling a volume of 30,000 cubic meters. And he consolidated all those three facilities into one new facility that was uh, double, double that capacity. There you can see uh, a picture of the engine room. And in the top right hand corner, you see the insulated air coolers uh, mounted on top of the uh, ante room in the in the ceiling cavity. And in the bottom uh, right hand corner, you see the uh, uh, the defrost flaps uh, moving. So this particular flap is about to open and then it'll rest against this. Um, you can see my cursor, but it'll rest against this uh, shelf here in the fully open position. And then uh, ambient air will be drawn in through the opening here, pushed through the coil and then pushed back out again. And uh, that affects the defrost. Now cold lag air distribution uh, is, this was, a re this was basically a, a requirement here by the, the owner and also by the, by the builder in order to avoid uh, ducting inside the refrigerated space. So on this picture on the left here, you see the air inlet opening uh, where my cursor is. The air is blown vertically down in front of the door. You can see there's a little deflector here above the door. And the air then crawls at floor level to the opposite end of the freezer store. In the process of flowing along the floor, uh, the air picks up heat and because uh, the density of the air reduces as it picks up heat it'll slowly rise to the ceiling and then it'll return to the evaporator at high level uh, there's an opening a, a return air opening here above this hood and this is where the air returns to um, the insulated cooler and here's a um, cfd simulation of the of the temperature distribution so you can see the temperature scale over here on the on the right. And um, this this has been verified as being pretty correct uh, in practice. Uh, the air distribution pattern inside the freezer is disturbed a little bit by the rack blast freezer, but I'll show you a picture of the rack blast freezer a little bit later on. So how does the energy efficiency uh, stack up? Well, we get an idea of that from this uh, slide here. All these little red dots, they come from a major cold storage chain in the United States. And all the different plant concepts you can see here, they are as marked, two-stage ammonia, CO2. Uh, there's some ammonia DX plants, uh, several different compressor types, etc. And this facility that I showed you before, when we are storing only, when we're not blast freezing, where my cursor is, is the specific uh, energy consumption. Specific energy consumption is the annual energy consumption in kilowatt hours divided by the refrigerated volume, which in this case is uh, 60,000 cubic meters. And that's shown on the vertical here, here along the horizontal, we have the refrigerated volume. So in this case, 60,000 cubic meters. Okay, so that should be relatively easy to follow. When we are blast freezing full capacity, 300 tons per week, the facility consumes what is represented by this blue star here. So the annual uh, electricity costs uh, went from 900,000 to $260,000, give or take. Now, this is no, not all a result of the uh, refrigeration plant, but the, the client also invested in um, solar panels. 
solar panels are responsible for approximately $120,000 of the savings. So by going from uh, HFC systems servicing 30,000 cubic meters to a dry expansion ammonia plant servicing 60,000 cubic meters, the annual electricity consumption reduced by approximately $500,000 uh, without, to $600,000 without considering the solar panel. The capital cost of the system uh, is about 3 million or was about 3 million. So the investment is returned in five to six years uh, on annual energy savings only originating from the refrigeration plant. For this particular client, he will operate this storm, this operating lease that, that, that goes for 15 years. So he will return the entire investment in the refrigeration plant in uh, much less than half the leasing period. Now, this is the uh, second example. This is a very recent installation. It was only commissioned last, last month. I uh, believe this is the biggest uh, ammonia dry expansion system in the Southern Hemisphere or servicing the biggest uh, refrigerated warehouse in, in the Southern Hemisphere. Here we see a plan layout. So this side here is nearly 200 meters long. So that gives you an idea of, of the size of the facility. So we have a, a large freezer area sort of here, a large chiller area here. These are relatively high ceiling heights. Over here, we have lower ceiling height areas. And here we have an area where we do blast freezing, okay? Total volume about 250,000 cubic meters. So it's about half the volume of the facility that Jonathan mentioned before, uh, the Heathwood facility, that, that one is about 500,000 cubic meters. So here's some um, sort of, um, just get rid of this so I can, we have a low, low temperature, high temperature capacity of, of 900 slash 360 kilowatts, respectively. The uh, ammonia inventory is probably a little bit more than the 900 kilos I got there. It's probably more like between 900 and 1,000. Uh, the actual recorded specific energy consumption for the first four days, four days of operation, uh, after we achieved the design room temperature was recorded at 9.2 kilowatt hours per cubic meter per year for storage only. It is expected uh, to come down a little bit because it'll probably take the best part of 12 to 18 months to uh, get the, uh, the ground below the freezer to the steady state condition where all the heat has been pulled out. So we expect this result to uh, get better. Um, there's a mixture of screw compressors and reciprocating compressors in the, in the job. I'll show you a picture later. And there are no ammonia pumps uh, whatsoever. And the uh, total ammonia charge in all of these evaporators throughout the facility is, is less than 40 kilos. This is the operating charge, I should say. So here's some uh, images of the plant when it was doing construction. I, I do have some better photos, but just not in this uh, presentation. So here we see the three reciprocators here and the two screw machines in the background. This is the big freezer with the three penthouse evaporators here where my cursor is. And on the next slide here, we see some of the low ceiling areas. Uh, I think we're standing in the chiller here. I don't quite remember. This is, um, the bottom picture here is a, a picture of the dehumidification. We blow dehumidified air down in front of the doorway uh, to um, prevent infiltration. So this is a curtain of dehumidified air that is coming down in front of the doorway. And here we see the uh, in-rack blast freezing system. This is in that corner that I indicated before on the previous slide. All that happens there is uh, we're drawing air from the general freezer environment uh, through the product. And this is simply a palletized product with the uh, spaces in between. And that then causes the product to freeze. And uh, another example 
as again, as far as I'm aware, this is the first ammonia dry expansion abattoir in Australia. A very small abattoir in southern Australia where they uh, kill goats and other small stock. So we have up here where my cursor is, we have the plant room in plain view. We have a chiller slash marshalling area here, frozen storage here, and uh, two blast freezers here. There's a room for a future blast freezer here. One of those can run as a chiller. I don't recall which one, but one of them can run as a blast chiller. And here we see a, a, um, an AutoCAD 3D drawing. This is the compressor area. These are the compressors here. This is the condenser. And uh, I believe this over here might be the freezer room evaporator or the chiller. This might be the freezer here. I can't quite see. And then the freezer in the background. Okay. And uh, that was all I had for you this afternoon. So, or this morning, I think it's afternoon here, morning at your place. Thank so, you. Thank feel you. free to ask questions. And again, I would like to invite our uh, delegates, participants to submit their questions. I, I have a couple for you, Stefan, to start with. Uh, that slide, you know, I think if you just came today and showed that one slide, that should be enough when you are presenting the 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 cost of the system and the annual say uh, the was the annual savings right six hundred thousand the the capital cost one million maybe you can go back to the slide i mean I'll try. It, I'll it's, try. Such a, it's such a clear business case right when you were bidding for this project was it was there some alternative technologies that they were considering is there anything close that can come to this you know capital cost slash annual saving return in what five years and basically making money ever since uh, after. Uh, this this case was an unusual case. Um, the, the the client the client went through a developer, but the client had direct contact with with us as the refrigeration plant builders, and he made the effort to come and look at some uh, low charge plants. Uh, this job was in Melbourne. He made the effort to come to Brisbane to look at some low charge plants we had completed there and uh, basically dictated to the developer, uh, I want this kind of plant. And if it costs extra, I'll pay the difference between what this plant costs and, and what the cheapest costs. So we have, a, we have a split incentive problem in Australia and we probably have the same problem in many other places in the world. The developer hires a building contractor and the building contractor, he calls tenders from uh, a bunch of different refrigeration contractors and basically picks the cheapest, right? And, and frankly, there's, there's probably only 10 to 15% difference in capital costs between uh, the most energy efficient plant and the cheapest. So if we take 10% of $3 million and, and that's $300,000 and we save five to $600,000 a year in, in energy costs, well, the payback is less than a year on that differential investment. So this was the client's call uh, the client basically made the decision, I want this kind of plant, and um, it went that way. Would the answer to this problem be that the awareness across the end users needs to be simply higher in terms of what the energy penalty slash energy savings could be if they're, you know, if the builder of the of the cold store, if there is this, you know, perverse incentive in place to go as cheap as possible on the initial cost, is it the awareness of the end users that helps solve this issue? Uh, it is that, uh, and and it's probably a bunch of other things. But awareness is very important for for people like me who are just uh, mere contractors. Um, it's hard. It's hard to get the message across. It is hard to be believed. Sometimes we try to market systems where we might try to convince the end user that the energy efficiency improvement is a factor three. This is a very, very hard sell. Even if, even if it's possible to back up uh, the claims with energy performance data from 30 systems, it is still a very difficult sell. It is even more difficult if you're trying to convince someone to replace an existing system that uses too much energy. Uh, generally, you're met with uh, the comment that well, the plant's been giving me good service for 10 years 
and why should I replace it? And even if you can demonstrate a simple payback period of five to six years, it rarely happens. So it's it just... happens on, on some occasions when you're competing with mm -hmm. or when you're taking out an HFC based system such as here. But if you're trying to convince someone to replace an existing ammonia plant with another ammonia plant that is more efficient, this is very difficult to do. Well, I only have one example, which I'll be telling you about, I think, later on. Is this the case of too good to be true? It sounds of too course. good to be true? Of course. I mean, I faced similar, similar issues at the IIAR meeting in March this year, where I demonstrated a few examples. Uh, this one, this was one of them. And uh, claiming 30% energy efficiency improvement by switching from liquid overfeed to dry expansion. And uh, this is also very difficult for some people to believe. And this is not, the 30% is not the case for every system. If you have a system where the liquid runs downhill all the way from all the evaporators back to the plant room, it won't be 30%. But for most conventional cold stores like I've just been showing you here, 30% is, is realistic. We, we were having similar discussions already back four or five years in Australia. And then you were, you were having first of these DX projects online. You mentioned 30, is that 30 completed projects? Yeah, 30 is the number now. Okay. Uh, a lot of these are so-called scan packs. So these are packaged units. Uh, they're packaged in a 40 foot container and they go to site in a, in a 40 foot container. And we are totally booked out uh, until February next year uh, in in the factory. So the, I mean, this is something that we have heard from a number of companies in, in refrigeration in Europe and elsewhere. And we had this discussion together with you as well. And this is a very busy time for industrial refrigeration within all that mess that is taking place globally, right? Yes, and, and, and the real concern is that once once the, the HSC bubble breaks, I mean, it is a fact that Australia, the, the, the stockpile of HFCs uh, that was accumulated in 2017 in Australia is just about depleted now. And when the HFC bubble bursts, when people realize they can't get HFCs anymore, not even at a reasonable price, I think the industrial, particularly the, the natural refrigerant uh, industry is going to be overloaded. I can tell you that that uh, on this, now that we have this slide here open, there's a scan pack servicing a 27,000 cubic meter cold store near Brisbane. So that's about here. Mm -hmm. And his energy consumption is 18 kilowatt hours per cubic meter per year. So this is where my cursor now is. Yep. Uh, so you can see he's a very, very long distance from the rest of these facilities in, in the US. Uh, and again, uh, his energy bill, bill has been, or his energy consumption has been constant since the plant was commissioned two years ago. He's a very good operator. He's very good at uh, managing the facility, but this level of efficiency is uh, is too good to be true, like you said. Is there, what what is the percentage of the projects that, uh, that the industry, the Natref industry, loses to HFCs or HFOs in industrial refrigeration? Is it marginal or is there still a big chunk? Is there a lot that needs to be done here? Look, look. according to uh, the expert group at the last era refrigeration conference, which you attended, uh, HFC consumption in Australia is still rising. But that's air conditioning, isn't it? Is it refrigeration? Oh, no, no, it's also refrigeration. Okay. okay. So we're not winning the battle, uh, that is for sure. That, that brings me to the next question, which is about the HFOs. Uh, I, I asked Jonathan about this as well, and you follow this very closely in terms of what's happening in Europe, different uh, governments and, and research on institutions. Academia had published reports on the TFA and, and you know all the, all the other uh, issues relevant to HFOs. Same in US, right? There has been discussion uh, going on. Uh, we had the atmosphere in DC two weeks ago, a lot discussed there too. Japan yesterday, I would say, was the first time when the policymakers took notice of, of this issue to be raised by the industry, kind of brought from abroad to the to the you know the stage of atmosphere in, in Tokyo yesterday. 
there hasn't been much discussion at ERA at all, actually, uh, when it comes to HFOs as a new generation of chemicals and associated problems or issues that are kind of emerging. What is the level of knowledge about this topic in Australia? And is there any discussion taking place? I, I don't think the knowledge is there. I, I personally raised the question at the uh, latest ERA conference. I don't know whether you were there at that time yeah. or not. But uh, I raised a question um, about the, um, I think it's five European countries that have made the move to make HFOs part of the uh, forever chemical group, the PFAS chemicals. And uh, the presenter I asked uh, had no knowledge of that move. And I think all of the European Union uh, is only a matter of time before they will make that move. And then it'll rub off on Australia uh, sometime after that, I think. Yeah, you're right. I, I was still tuned in when you asked about the HFOs and the response was that not aware of any upcoming challenges for HFO, right? I think that was along the way. So maybe Australian industry is, is in for some surprise if, if the Europeans get their act together and include uh, HFCs, you know, uh, or HFOs under the PFAS. So we'll see what happens there. Or, or... Yeah, please. Or perhaps, perhaps we will continue to be the, the, the dump and ground for HFC equipment that nobody else wants. Hopefully not, because we see so much of the leadership when it comes to natrifs on, on, you know, on these fronts. You, you are a great example. So it's, it's about awareness, as, as we discussed a while ago. And then this topic is, is heating up across the board. You know, I, I think we have made enough mistakes when it comes to new generation of chemicals and the industry needs to be aware of uh, the risk associated with this choice. Uh, Jonathan is, is returning uh, the question to you and he's asking, do you think it would be easier to sell efficiency uplift projects if some government rebate on savings could be provided? I think we're heading in that direction. I mean, uh, Jonathan and others are, are aware that Neighbours, Neighbours is a government organisation, I, I don't remember what it stands for, uh, something with... Um, Australian built environment energy consumption reduction or some nonsense. But neighbours uh, are doing uh, star ratings on office buildings. And uh, they are about to launch a star rating system for cold stores. So this, uh, I believe, will increase awareness. Now, if, if that then starts to penetrate the way cold store projects are being specified, so, for example, it says in the specification on the first page, this cold store must meet the requirements for a six star rating for a refrigerated warehouse, then we might start to get somewhere. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Stefan, today. Uh, great to talk to you. Thank you for sharing all the latest uh, updates from, from Australia on your projects with DX Low Charge Ammonia. We will we will certainly have uh, opportunity to meet in a few weeks time uh, in in Melbourne at the ARP. So I look forward to that being being back, and uh, we will be now ready to proceed with the with the session with uh, Matthew Derby from EcoChill. So thank you again, Stefan, for joining us today. Matthew, uh, if you can hear us, please join us with a camera as well, and uh, we will be uh, ready to receive your presentation. Hello to you as well, to New Zealand. Hello, so, hoping you can hear me okay. Absolutely, great. How are you today? Yeah, it's, I'm great, thank you. Um, I'm standing here in my office in uh, Auckland, and it's uh, blue skies outside, even though rain was forecast, so I'm feeling pretty fortunate right now. That's great, that's great. Now we have a massive heat wave in very early this year in June. We have 36, 38 degrees, very unusual for Japan actually. It hasn't been the, the hottest June on record, or, or at least it feels like that. So the weather is, yeah, well, not as fortunate here, I would say, but all good here as well. Thank you again for your time today. Uh, we are very excited to hear on uh, what you have been working on the last couple of years. A pretty exciting project and a brand new sector with CO2. So we very much look forward to hearing your presentation. Yeah, great. Well, I'll, I'll do my best. It's always difficult to follow after Stefan. And, you know, we, Stefan's talking megawatts and uh, today I'm going to be talking mere kilowatts. So, um, yeah, a bit of uh, kilowatt envy there, but never mind. Um, Nevertheless, uh, it will be great. So uh, please go ahead and share your screen and uh, thank you again for joining us today. Okay. Um, is, that, uh, is that coming through okay? 
Yes, we see you and hear you well. So I will uh, go off the stage. So it's all yours. Okay. Um, just one moment. Okay. Alrighty. Well, um, so thank you for having me here today, and it's um, it's great to be talking to you again after a couple of years of uh, of us all hunkering down and uh, having to hide away. Um, but today, um, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, on farm refrigeration, and I'll just see if I can get this mouse to work. Can you hear me? Okay, still. Hmm. Uh, you might be able to move uh, the the icons to move your slides should be in the left bottom corner when you who over yes hmm. okay there we go whoops right so <laughs> okay um, i'm not that familiar with zoom my apologies so um yeah as uh, as introduced my name is matthew darby and I am the managing director and founder of uh, EcoChill, which is a commercial and industrial contracting business, and also the founder and managing director of Cold Energy, which is a business that is, uh, has been created for the development of uh, technology and refrigeration uh, equipment into the marketplace. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here talking to you today about the use of uh, CO2 for on-farm cooling and water heating. So uh, the journey started quite some time ago now. Um, uh, for those of you who aren't aware, uh, the New Zealand um, industry is very much, or the economy is very much underpinned by the dairy farming sector. And in New Zealand, it's pretty unusual to be in, um, in the population here and not know somebody who's in dairy farming. So a good friend of mine who runs a number of dairy farms approached me around about 14 years ago with a problem of uh, poor performance of his on-farm cooling. And at the time, um, I did explain to him that eco chill just doesn't work in that space. But after a fair bit of pressure, we sat down and discussed some of the challenges that they face. Uh, number one, uh, cooling compliance. So every time we're uh, on farm, they feel like they're just getting ahead. Um, they change the regulations and milk needs to be cooled faster and it needs to be uh, down to a lower temperature than previous. So that's a real challenge for them to constantly be chased by compliance uh, compliance settings. Secondly, there's the challenge around emissions. And as you know, um, a lot of emissions come from uh, dairy farming, in particular from the cows, um, uh, from rumination. Uh, and of course, we've also got the HFC refrigerant emissions. Um, and then, of course, we've got a challenge around refrigerant itself. So the Kigali Amendment has meant the phase down of HFCs, which we'll talk to in a minute. And of course, we've always got the challenge uh, for energy consumption reduction. And ironically, here in New Zealand, where some 85% of our energy is generated uh, by renewables, which is a fantastic position for us to be in. However, many dairy farmers find themselves at the end of the grid. So a lot of our dairy farms are um, out in rural places where uh, they are at the end of the line. So they, they suffer from... Uh, inconsistent power supply, brownouts, um, that kind of thing, which has been a real challenge uh, for them to manage over the years. So putting extra load on uh, any infrastructure when you're at the end of the line is not a good idea. And then of course, the age old issue uh, around cost. So operating expense, um, imagine your, uh, your plant, you're constantly upgrading the size of your plant to uh, try and reduce um, or comply with um, cooling compliance requirements. Uh, and things are getting bigger and bigger and using more energy. So that's a real challenge for them as well. So if we just look here uh, around uh, the impact of the, uh, um, the uh, reduction in supply, uh, if you like, of refrigerants, um, we have in New Zealand a, uh, a pretty clear mandate around the reduction in high GWP refrigerants. And that's driven by our HFC phase down. Um, the reality is though, it doesn't really matter what uh, regulations we put in place locally. We are a taker of technology and, um, and materials here in New Zealand. So if uh, the Northern Hemisphere, for example, decides to drive down the HFC or the reduction in high GWP gases faster than New Zealand, the reality is the supply is going to start to dry up and our access to those refrigerants is going to keep reducing and we will be forced into adopting other technologies or gases anyway. So 
while we like to think we've got uh, control over um, our destiny to a certain extent, that's simply not, not the case. Uh, one other thing that is uh, driving intolerable risk for users of HFCs uh, is um, our ETS or our um, unit NZ unit price. So you can see here from the graph that uh, in the last two years, we've had close to a, a um, trebling of the price of an NZU. And that, uh, that has a huge impact on cost of refrigerant, particularly the high GWP gases like 404A. Here's what that looks like. Uh, if, if you take a look at the table here, you can see that a cost of 404A today, if you were to walk in um, off the street into a wholesaler and ask for the a price of a retail price of a cost of refrigerant, you're gonna be somewhere between eight to $900 for a one kilo of 404A. About $300 of that is coming from the cost of the NZU. Uh, so you can understand that uh, eight years ago, a cost of 404A, retail cost of a kilo of 404A was some 30 to $60. We're now talking $900. So in the space of eight years, uh, there's been a, a, a huge increase in price and it's something that uh, end users are really struggling to get their heads around. Ironically, uh, if we just stay with the dairy farm industry for a moment, uh, typically a, uh, an on-farm refrigeration system needs somewhere between 20 and 25 kilos of, of refrigerant to charge from empty. Uh, so we're going to, if we're using 404A and a 20 kilo charge is gonna incur some $6,000 of ETS cost alone, uh, and around about a third of the total cost of the refrigerant charge. So $18,000 is gonna be spent on refrigerant Compare that to CO2, uh, it's $20 a kilo. So this is where CET or cold energy comes in. Um, our, mission, our vision, if you like, is to accelerate zero carbon cooling naturally. What does that look like? Well, it's been a bit of a journey. And just to put, give you some perspective, uh, EcoJewel, founded by myself in 2000, uh, has had a, um, a long list of um, development of natural refrigerant solutions in the marketplace. And it was when I was with my uh, dairy farming friend uh, back in 2009, and we identified this, this problem on farm cooling technology that hasn't changed for some 45 years. Uh, we realized pretty quickly that that's just not EcoChill's forte. EcoChill is very much a servicing and contracting business. And the problem that we were, I had identified and were looking to solve was more around introduction, introduction of new technology and hence um, Eco2 Dairy and Cold Energy was born. It was not a, um, it was not a, 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 a quick thing to do though. You can see uh, a number of prototypes uh, were developed through the years before we finally settled on a, a reliable transcritical CO2 solution. Uh, and in those early days where we spent a lot of time blowing hydrocarbon compressors up um, and trying to squeeze as much out of systems as we possibly could before we, um, before we achieved uh, the desired outcome. So in terms of the opportunity, uh, really it's uh, pretty succinctly down to better milk, better for farmers and better for the planet. And we break that down into four pillars. So we have a clean cooling solution. So we're able to provide a, a real roadmap for end users on um, a zero emissions cooling system um, that also has immediate reductions in both um, emissions through uh, reduction in energy consumption, but a, a reduction in emissions through leakage. Secondly, we have an industry step change and I can show you a little bit more about that in a moment, but in a nutshell, as I said to you before, we have a, an issue here in New Zealand where we're using the same technology uh, for cooling of milk on farm that we have for the last 40 plus years. 99.9% .9 of the vats are vertical uh, and the only source of cooling um, is through a direct expansion uh, conventional system, direct expansion through evaporated dimple pads that are stuck to the bottom of the, the vat. And in extremely tall vats, in those instances, there's maybe the third, the bottom third of the vat has a, an additional dimple pad around it. So when you think about that and say, well, milk's coming into the vat at, at best at around 16, maybe 18 degrees, and we have to get that milk to below six degrees within two hours of the last cow walking out of the shed, uh, that's a real challenge for DX. And of course, um, going natural, so the use of CO2 or a natural refrigerant over a synthetic, 
and that final um, that final challenge or pillar to address is the reduction in operating expenses. So our solution, um, Eco2 Dairy and uh, Judy here, you can see it in the images. Uh, she has a, a small farm, some 425 cows. Uh, we installed one of our units into her farm in 2017. It's been running there ever since, and uh, she's experienced a close enough to 100% reduction in CO2 emissions through leakage, and around about a 65% reduction in emissions, uh, in total emissions, including energy consumption. Um, and we've done that using our our own patented technology. So the uh, the system is, uh, has uh, patents in a number of countries around the world now and um, has proven very successful two degree milk into the vat, 80 plus degree water into the hot water cylinders and around a 35% reduction in OPEX for duty. So a quick snapshot of, uh, of a conventional system versus our system. So if you look on the left hand side there, um, you can see it's almost two systems really. We have the milk cooling system. So cow walks into the shed, uh, milk's uh, extracted and um, pushed through a primary plate heat exchanger, which has bore water or town supply water running through it. And we take around about 20 degrees of heat out of the milk. It comes out of the uh, pre-cooler plate heat exchanger and is pump pumped straight into the vat where our conventional system cooling system then takes over. As I said before, dimple plates for evaporators on the base. And at best, um, uh, DX refrigeration is normally evaporating around about minus five to minus eight, something like that. Uh, and depending on um, the, uh, the level of knowledge of both the contractor and the farmer in that area, uh, you'll often get a farmer say, give me the next size up and condensing unit. So I've got a bit more grunt than what I need. And all we end up doing is almost sucking the evaporator plates inside out and operating at a very, very low um, evaporating temperature and putting at risk the milk from icing up instantly. Having said that, um, as long as we get the milk at currently, as long as the milk is, uh, or the milk must be at six degrees or below within two hours of the last uh, set of cups coming off or the last cow being milked before the tanker can collect it. And then we're under pressure to, at the same time, um, take water, town supply water or bore water from entering temperature, which is normally around 16 degrees and heat that all the way up to 80 degrees. And that's done with electric elements inside a hot water cylinder or two. Compare that to our system on the right-hand side. A cow walks into the shed uh, and is milked and that milk passes through the pre-cooler. Uh, so we scrub a bit of heat off, mostly 16 to 20 degrees. Uh, we then pass through a second bank of heat exchanger where we have our ice water, which um, we've spent the off peak period building ice in an ice tank. Somewhere between three, uh, two and a half to three cubic meters of ice has been, been um, uh, built in our ice bank. And the chill or zero degree water is pumped through the plate heat exchanger and the milk is dropped down to two degrees almost instantly, where it's then delivered into the vat at two and is held at two until collection. So uh, we're now providing the milk uh, at ready pickup temperature instantly, which uh, takes a lot of pressure off both the farmer and the dairy uh, aggregator or the collector. Um, but in the event of the aggregator not being able to pick it up uh, promptly, um, we also have disconnected uh, the conventional system from those plate heat, uh, dimple plate evaporators on the bottom of the vat and we're pumping zero degree water through those dimple plates as well. So we're maintaining two degree temperature in the vat until pickup it can be can be made. At the same time, though, we're a, we're a transcritical CO2 system. So we're creating a lot of heat while we're making our ice. And that heat is used uh, and pumped directly through a heat exchanger that we've made ourselves, which uh, then uh, transfers the heat into the water, incoming water for the hot water. And that is heated up to some 80 odd degrees um, within a few hours. So this is what it looks like in, in, in real life. Uh, you can see here uh, an exploded uh, diagram where you, or graph where you can see the green line um, running along the top, that is the milk temperature entering into our plate heat exchanger. And you can see that coming in at around 18 degrees. And the red line along the bottom is the milk leaving the heat exchanger at the same time. So uh, we're pumping somewhere between five to seven liters of milk per second um, in peak flow. And uh, we're, so we're pushing through milk 
uh, and dropping it to two degrees instantly, and it is then dropping into the vat where it's sitting waiting for collection. And if you look at the graph further over on the uh, on the right hand side, you can see a typical day of milk milking cycle in a, um, in a in peak season. So we've got two milkings going on, one in the morning, uh, and uh, pickup happens shortly after. And you can see the skyscraper there, the large skyscraper. That's the vat. The plant wash is the smaller one, and then the the uh, the vat wash directly after it. And uh, then subsequently we go into um, an afternoon milk and the same milking profile, two degree milk into the vat. Uh, but once we've finished milking, we have another wash down, plant wash down ready for the next milk. So here's a quick overlay of um, a comparison. So we, we, we retrofitted a uh, Eco2 dairy system into the Stalker farm uh, last year. And we uh, were able to capture data prior to the installation. So we had a, um, a very modern, I think it was about three years old, 404A condensing unit with EC fan motors uh, and two hot water cylinders with electric elements in them. And that's the blue line you can see, um, see soaring across the, uh, the page there. And it's really, um, you know, barring a few uh, peaks and troughs, it's really pretty consistent in terms of energy as in, is being consumed pretty much all the time. Um, whether we're heating water or refrigerating the milk. By comparison, the orange line gives you an indication of our transcritical system in operation. So the very left-hand side of the graph for the first, first portion, you can see pretty even sawtooth uh, form, and that is our system maintaining both ice and water temperature. Uh, we then go into a milking phase where we drop off uh, using any energy, um, barring a, an agitator, um, an aerator, and the water pump. Uh, we then complete the milk and we go straight into ice build and hot water generation, and our software automatically drives the transcritical position uh, to maximise the heat uh, recovery for hot water as quickly as possible. And then we go back into maintenance and then another milking phase or in that particular instance, the middle trough there, that is actually the system in standby awaiting um, the next morning milk. So we're sitting there um, doing nothing, waiting for the workload to start. And then you can see we go through the cycle again. Overall, we're using some 32% less energy than an efficient 404A condensing unit with two electric um, heated hot water cylinders at I think 400, 450 litres per cylinder. Uh, back to Judy. Uh, so for Judy now, um, as I said to you before, 425 cows, about 24 litres per cow um, per day in peak. Uh, she's um, experienced a, about a 35% reduction in energy consumption and a 61% reduction in total emissions. So that's leakage and energy consumption and a 99.99% reduction in emissions through direct, direct emissions through leakage. So uh, the Stalker Farm is a 600 cow herd, and we have um, we completed some recent calculations here. As you can see, although the cost of capital is um, reasonably high by comparison, the operating costs over a 15-year life are vastly, vastly reduced. So um, the return on investment um, occurs around year three, and you can see the savings just compound after that across the 15-year life of the system. And uh, if we were to draw a line at the 15 years, uh, the savings would be some $440,000 in energy and around $56,000 in refrigerant based on um, leakage rates of, uh, I think, 15% um, per year. So just to summarize, um, we talk a lot about uh, the need for um, reduction of CO2 emissions and um, reduction of energy. And we've done some work and said, well, if of the 11 and a half thousand farms across New Zealand, and a number of those farms have more than one condensing unit. Uh, so if we're there's 16 and a half thousand condensing units, if every single one of those condensing units was to be converted to an Eco2 dairy system or a transcritical system with hot water heat recovery that performed the same, you can see here the numbers are pretty phenomenal. We would have some, we would deliver some 3.7% of New Zealand's total targeted emissions reductions. We would have around a 1% reduction on the entire country's energy demand. 
So these numbers aren't to be aren't to be sniffed at. These are very significant, um, and I I feel that uh, uh, we've certainly lived up to um, to our um, our vision of um, a zero cooling zero carbon cooling economy. So thank you for listening. Matthew, thank you very much. Very interesting presentation, and you have listed all the details that could be of an interest to our uh, to our delegates and, and to ourselves. I, I still like to ask you a couple a couple of details about that. The, the business case, you have been, again, you presented all the, the, the numbers there, payback uh, in three years' time. What is the potential for this technology to be deployed in uh, New Zealand and beyond, right? Do you see demand in uh, the rest of Asia Pacific? Do you Are you receiving you know, uh, interest from other countries? Uh, it's a good question. We, um, I have to, I have to admit that uh, we certainly haven't been marketing ourselves uh, at all at this point. So, we've spent a huge amount of time to uh, develop and uh, prove performance, which we've done now, and we're only just starting to market now. Uh, to answer your question, though, I certainly see that this this could be scaled up very quickly, and um, we are not we're not shy about uh, introducing it globally. I certainly think that the opportunities for uh, for this technology to to be deployed quickly um, are, are huge, and uh, yeah, we see it as a, a a very easy way in which to roll out new technology, uh, but tested and proven uh, very very quickly. You have uh, you have you are known for the projects with hydrocarbons in some of the the, the facilities in in uh, New Zealand and what 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 led you to this direction in terms of CO two being applied to cold you know to the to the diary uh, sector and how much was how, how difficult was it to fine tune the CO two system to fit this application in particular? Um, yeah, look, I think um, the development of the CO2 system into the dairy sector was actually quite a challenge initially. Um, we are, you're right, EcoChill is known for its development of hydrocarbons, but equally it uh, it has, has delivered a number of firsts in the CO2 sector as well. And now I think back to 2012 and EcoChill did the first transcritical CO2 supermarket in the country. And um, ironically, it's actually often um, developing technology into those uh, bigger systems um, is can be easier than squeezing that technology down into small systems at a cost effective um, pr uh, point. So I think the bigger challenge for the development of on farm cooling was the uh, it's difficult to compete um, and it is um, as Stefan said before, uh, it's, and, um, it's really difficult to compete uh, on price sometimes when there is still an abundance of uh, users of HFCs, even though the cost of the refrigerant is high, uh, there is a, there's still quite a push by um, many of the wholesalers and distributors for the use of synthetics because they have stock and they wanna get rid of that stock. But that, those times will pass and we will see an uplift, I'm, I'm sure, in the use of naturals. Um, but yeah, the, uh, um, the deployment of the technology um, wasn't as straightforward as we first thought it would be, but we've, yeah, we've nailed it now and uh, yeah, we're very comfortable with um, the, uh, the way in which we've condensed the tech down into that nice, small, tidy box and, and the performance that we deliver. That's great. And, and the numbers, again, speak for themselves. Uh, when it comes to the, the capital, you know, the operating cost savings and the lifetime cost of, of the system at all. I asked uh, both Jonathan and Stefan about the, the HFOs and the discussions that are taking place in the country. Could you speak on behalf of what is the discussion about the HFOs and the issues that are being discussed in both Europe and US and increasingly elsewhere when it comes to TFAs and possible restriction control of, of HFOs under the reach? You know? What is happening in HFO when it comes to this topic? Uh, sorry, New Zealand when it comes to this topic. Yeah, um, well, from a contractor's point of view, um, we're starting to see a, a bit of an uptick in the use of HFOs, but they are primarily um, still in a blend state. Um, we've seen very few of the of the um, uh, A2L uh, HFOs coming across the border. 
um, to my knowledge anyway. Um, but there is a growing um, drive for the upskilling of the industry to manage flammable refrigerants full stop. So whether it's an HFO or a hydrocarbon, um, because it's become pretty clear uh, to, to the industry that flammables or high pressure uh, are going to be what we're going to have to manage as a service and installation um, industry. Um, but the, yeah, certainly the, the awareness around the potential uh, harm and um, negative impacts of HFOs at both an environmental level, but also, also from a health and safety point of view, uh, that is still largely um, either unknown or if it is known, it's unacknowledged and it's, uh, we see it as a real, uh, a real risk and something that we need to work really hard to, 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 I guess, to make people aware of. I mean, at the end of the day, the user, the end user is going to make a decision based on the best information they have. And all we can hope to do is provide them with, a, um, with, a, with accurate and uh, trustworthy information which then they can make their own decisions on. But I do struggle to understand why anybody would want to use a, um, a toxic and flammable uh, chemical man-made substance when they can use a natural substance, even if it is still flammable, at least it's not toxic, right? One thing is for sure, we as an atmosphere will do our best to provide the, the updates on what these discussions are in Europe and uh, Euro, uh, US and elsewhere, because this is going to be the most important topic of, of the year and beyond in terms of making the right choice. Right? These decisions are being made for next 10, 20 years at times. And the mm -hmm. topics of uh, you know, the risks associated with HFOs are becoming increasingly clear. So we need to bring this discussion to all parts of the world and Australia and New Zealand are, are definitely uh, you know, we are receiving these messages that there is not enough discussion about this topic. So we shall we shall change it if possible. You yourself refer to clean cooling, uh, and you know, when you work with CO2 and hydrocarbons, other than sure refrigerants, so you, the, the clean cooling concept and difference uh, versus the dirty cooling is will, will be the topic that uh, our group CEO Mark Chasser will be addressing uh, today in the afternoon as a as a final session of the of the, the conference. So for those of you interested in knowing more about this topic, please tune in uh, for the final session. Matthew, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Uh, always a pleasure to work with you. Great uh, progress uh, in your labs uh, on, on the new technology and addressing uh, very exciting application with great results. So we hope to hear more about the new projects and then communicate about the end users, sharing their uh, you know, testimonies about the technology and looking forward to working with you uh, in, on the next occasion. Likewise, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. All right, and we are now ready to uh, move to our third uh, presenter in this session. And as already advertised, uh, we have a contribution from our good friend Marek Ziglinski. I'll just put the video right here and share it with you all. So this is an update on the IEC. Actually, we were in Australia in 2019, just the day uh, when the IEC was, uh, the update on, on standard for refrigeration was, uh, was uh, accepted. So there was exciting time for our last atmosphere. And here's an update from the chair of the committee, Marek Ziglinski. Morning, good afternoon. Here is uh, Marek Spiczynski from Embraco, Needed Global Appliance Company. Uh, it's a pleasure to present to you today the status of the international legislation related to commercial refrigeration. Uh, as you maybe know, I am the chair of the IC 61C committee and uh, the develop the most important product standard for commercial companies. Uh, I cannot be present uh, uh, in your event uh, today. Um, I was participating to Apple Japan since uh, uh, many years. This year, unfortunately, I'm not able to join, so I will record this uh, presentation for you and if you have any question related, please uh, contact uh, me directly or uh, Jan Dusek to put questions that you can have on, on the subject. 
Now I'll start sharing my screen uh, and start my presentation. Okay, so uh, I prepared this uh, this update together with Hiyoshi Hosomura, that uh, is a Japanese uh, refrigeration expert and was uh, basically essential to create this uh, presentation since he's really a, a person that has deep knowledge about Japanese uh, standards. So I uh, thank uh, Hiro for helping me in, in, in this preparation. So I will start with the uh, introduction. So the summary of my, my, uh, my speech, uh, I will start with the, let me say the, the, the reason why we are talking about this topic and, and what is the evolution, uh, recent evolution of the international standardization related to commercial refrigeration. Then I will dedicate most of my presentation to the uh, evolution of the, the uh, regional or, or country local standards related to the topic because the various regions are uh, adopting, uh, once the, the global standard IC is published, uh, uh, various regions are adopting the standard in their own uh, standardization system. And the last point I think is quite uh, important and new that what is happening now in Europe related to uh, REACH directive that is uh, related to the chemical substances and uh, basically will cover the topic of PFAS that is now becoming uh, a quite important uh, for uh, uh, important discussion ongoing, uh, at least in Europe, uh, but I think will cover all the, all the global works. So, as you know, uh, the reason why we are talking about the changes in standardization, because we, uh, uh, all the countries, uh, today we have, uh, today, uh, on my 20, uh, 132 uh, countries already ratified the Kigali Amendment, the, where the, the nations agreed to uh, reduce consumption of uh, so-called F gases or HFCs. Uh, this graph is the original Kigali uh, step-down uh, line. Europe recently published a proposal for the uh, even stronger reduction in the in coming years so we will see uh, next uh, january february what will be the outcome final outcome of european new updated f gas regulation so since the uh, eliminating uh, f gases because of the, their uh, climate impact the most of the alternatives except the co2 are uh, in some way flowed. So it was important to modify the standardization to uh, create uh, a safe manner to use also flammable refrigerants in various sectors uh, of, of, of the industry and in particular here for commercial refrigeration. Uh, as you know, the, the, the standards are uh, quite complex uh, 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 matter because involving uh, 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 different uh, global or local or regional organizations. So at the international level, the product standards are produced by AC, and here in, in, you can see the dash 89 standard that will be the topic of, of this, this speech. And in Japan, you have equivalent standard C9335-289. Uh, in, in other regions, you have other organizations following, basically adopting with or without modification the global standard uh, defined in ISC level. So, what are the, the, the main uh, elements of this uh, new uh, ISC edition that was published in, in June? Uh, 20 of uh, three years, basically three years ago. Uh, first thing was that the maximum refrigerant charge was increased from 150 grams to 13 times elephant with the limitation of 1.2 kilo as a max. So in case of propane, the, the maximum charge limit for self-contained cabinet 
was almost half a kilo. And in case of A2L, so mildly flammable refrigerants, this limit uh, was is 1.2 kilo in IOC level. To assure the same safety level as it was with 150 grams, additional requirements uh, are are necessary are uh, to necessary to fulfill and uh, to assure that those uh, requirements or those uh, elements are uh, really working. There is very important the concentration test in an XCC that has to demonstrate that in case of leak, the surroundings of the cabinet are safe. So, uh, obviously, some small notes. One is that below 150 grams, the requirements for the product uh, is uh, like was before, so are not changing, except very small uh, elements. Uh, the new fact is that the ice uh, makers are now part of the scope. Before, it was not inside the standard, it was in the 75. And the remote system are not covered by the standard. So, in the global level, ISO standard has to be used and not the IFC product standard. So, ISO standard that is uh, so called general uh, safety standard. Uh, what are the types of system that are covered by this 89? And you can see several uh, uh, types of cabinets. What is new, as I said, is ice makers that are now part of the scope. But other machines, for example, professional ice cream makers, it's their own standard, this 118, quite new standard. For the laboratory equipment, there is 610.10.2011 that is covering also flammable refrigerants. Vending machines are, uh, are covered by 75 standard and cold rooms uh, and remote system, as I said, by ISO 5149. That uh, is just to, to be clear that this 89 is not covering this kind of application, even if today the uh, standardization group is working to include some kind of working uh, rooms into the standard scope. So, uh, once published IFC uh, standard at the global level, most of the countries that they don't have their own standardization systems are uh, in, in, in possibility to apply it already. But obviously, the, the most important is uh, some specific region, important region in terms of uh, industrial uh, presence uh, has to adopt. The first one was Australia and New Zealand that already uh, in 2020, one year after after um, IAC, published the uh, addition uh, uh, New Zealand, uh, Australia New Zealand version of IAC that would basically no deviation with uh, to the original IAC. Then let's go to Japan. And here the, there's the Main, main points related to Japanese version of the standard that was developed by the uh, specific committee uh, with support of Jaraya. Uh, this was published already in March uh, 2021, so more than one year ago, but with together with uh, guidelines. Those guidelines are essential for application of the standard. And I will talk a little bit more about uh, let me say, addition, addition that was uh, 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 that are present in the Japanese version of the standard as well in inside the guideline that has to be used used together with uh, uh, JEC-89 standard. So, and there are important differences. And here, uh, maybe you, after this meeting, you can uh, see it uh, uh, more in detail, but uh, there are uh, several differences between the original IAC version and the Japanese version of the standard. So, for example, in the scope, certain types of speed system are covered in IAC, only those with very small charts. That's basically not something excluding that, then 
from from the, the standard, then we have the in the marking of the system there is certain level of charge where we have to apply the the marking in in Japan all the system exceeding 150 grams has to be marked with minimum area uh, and there is very important difference that in Japanese version there is no the threshold of 1.2 kilo for the charge limit therefore uh, like with propane the quantity will stay in third time LFL but for uh, A2L category the charge limit is much larger uh, here is the example of Article uh, 32 and uh, has four kilos of of uh, the charge as a charge. Another difference is in the maximum surface temperature that in in IHC is related to the initial temperature. Instead, in Japanese version, this limit is linked to the host surface ignition ter temperature and was uh, defined as uh, 700 degrees C as a max uh, surface temperature of the components of the application. Then we we'll have differences in this uh, uh, leak test. And uh, basically, uh, the concept is slightly different. So basically, in Japan, all the charge has to be released in four minutes. This is following more or less this, this similar criteria of air conditioning uh, standard dashboard. <coughs> there is also a difference when you are simulating the leak. What is the the, the, the uh, refrigerant flow to, to create the, to simulate the leak that is much larger in Japanese uh, standard than EIS. And also the criteria of uh, approval of the of the test is different because in in Japan you cannot exceed. Uh, LFL uh, at all. Instead, in IHC, you have five minutes where, where LFL uh, can be exceeded in the present version of the standard. So, uh, Japanese uh, uh, version of the standard is quite different, so it requires also the, the, to, to follow the, the guidelines that I was mentioning before. Now, very quickly about uh, US and Canada. In the US, the US standard was published also last year. Uh, it is replacing more of the most of the US standard related to commercial refrigeration. Anyway, to enter in force in US, this standard has to be uh, approved first uh, as accepted uh, by EPA and then by ASHA 15, so general standard and, and building code. So in US still uh, we are waiting those approvals to be in, in position to apply the larger charge of refrigerant in US. Uh, here is a little bit more detail the scope of American edition is a little bit larger than, than I see, uh, including uh, partial systems, uh, the field directed system and also uh, split system. So the, the, the US version is much, much broader in terms of scope than original AC. The last uh, slide is about uh, Europe. Europe is the last one. Basically, we are still waiting the publication.